Good evening. My name is Alvin Rodriguez, and I am a professor of music here at La Sierra University and a longtime organist here at La Sierra University Church. And it's a pleasure for me to be here this evening uh, doing this Vespers to hopefully serve as a bridge between the week and the Sabbath that is soon to come. I hope that you find the music inspiring and the, the text that it's based on uh, helpful in everything you are going through at this time. I would like to start by reading uh, four short verses from the Bible that actually mention the organ. And these are all King James versions. Genesis 4, 20, 21 says, Adah gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. Other versions say pipes, and yet other versions say flutes. In either case, the organ has pipes, and it has flutes. So I think it's OK to say it's the organ. Job 21.12 says, they take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. Job 30.31 continues, my harp also is turned to mourning and my organ into the voice of them that weep. And finally, Psalm 150 verse 4 says, praise him with timbrel and dance, praise him with string instruments and organ. I have decided to start the Vespers with two popular hymns as a statement of gratitude and faith in Jesus Christ. I hope that tonight's Vespers praises his name and that it brings you closer to the throne of grace. I also hope that you'll learn some interesting things about the organ here at La Sierra University Church. The first hymn you heard, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, has been called the National Anthem of Christendom. The lyrics were written by Edward Peronet, and it first appeared in November 1779. There have been three tunes that have been associated with this hymn. The first tune, called Coronation, sounds like this, and it's probably the most popular tune. You've heard that tune, I'm sure, many times. The second, called Miles Lane, was composed by William Shrubsoul in 1779, and it was originally the tune that was used in Britain, and it sounds like this. And then, of course, the tune that you heard was the third version, which is often known as Diadem, and it was composed by James Eller in 1838. It is also a popular alternative to this particular hymn. Uh, the hymn that you heard was arranged by the popular American organist, composer, and conductor, Diane Bish. The next piece is titled Processional, and it was composed by Martin Shaw. Mr. Shaw, who was born in 1875 and died in 1958, was an English composer, conductor, and in his early life, a theater producer. His composed works number over 300, and they include songs, hymns, carols, oratorios, several instrumental works, a congregational mass setting called the Anglican Folk Mass. I would love to hear that. And four operas, including a ballad opera. In this particular piece, Mr. Shaw teases its listeners with fragments of an almost recognizable melody, but it's only at the end when he finally unleashes the complete tune of Praise to the Lord with the full organ. This hymn is based on Joachim Neander's German hymn published in 1680. I will ask you to sing along the first grand stanza of this well-known hymn of praise at the end of the piece when the organ plays the hymn tune completely. You will know because it's probably the loudest section of the piece right towards the end. And the words will show up on the screen. So enjoy processional.
it is not surprising that there are so many hymns and songs of praise embedded in this serious organ literature. As an instrument long associated with the church, and often reciting in a church or sanctuary, composers often would write their serious work incorporating religious texts and tunes. This was convenient because it garnered favor, I presume, with the church owning the instrument, while also guaranteeing a larger listening audience, something that was really not legitimized for instrumental music until the later Romantic period in music, middle to late 1800s. So, let's continue in our journey back in time to another composition. This time, it is by the famous um, Lutheran uh, reformer, Martin Luther, who wrote the Lutheran hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Of course, one of the best known hymns of our time. Uh, Luther was a prolific hymnodist. Luther also wrote the words and composed the melody sometime between 1527 and 1529. It is said to have been translated into English at least 70 times, 70, and also into many other languages. The words are a paraphrase of Psalm 46. Here is the text of this wonderful, and may I add, very pertinent psalm for our time especially in a coronavirus-dominated world. This is from the New, England, uh, New International Version. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the, earth, into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This well-known hymn is composed into a fugal prelude by the famous German composer, Johann Pachelbel. Yes, the same composer who wrote the famous Pachelbel Canon in D, that people hear in weddings, for example. This was way back in 1653 uh, when he was born. Um, he was a German composer, organist, and teacher. He is considered one of the very important composers of the Middle Baroque era with his chorale preludes and fugues. This piece starts with a fugue using the subject of the hymn tune. It is passed around from one voice to another, and then it goes into a prelude with a trio of voices. What's interesting here is that instead of my right hand, or even my left hand, carrying the melody, instead, my hands will be playing a supporting role to the main tune, which will show up in the pedals. Now, I think there's a question, so let me see what the question is. Ah, the question is, how long would it take to master this instrument, a music student to master this instrument? That's a good question. And I would say that a lot depends on what kind of training you've had. If you are a pianist that converts to the organ, you have a head start. Um, the piano has keyboards like the organ, although uh, the technique is definitely different. It does give you a point of reference that immediately gives you a technique and a, and a comfort with the keyboard. Uh, probably the hardest part is the pedal. So how long? It depends on the person and how much they practice and how much they really love it. But um, this is an instrument, like any other instrument, that uh, you work with it and you master one piece at a time rather than master the instrument. 
Um, and over time, over a long period of time, um, you end up mastering the, the instrument as well. But uh, I would say you would need at least five to ten years of practice um, before you start feeling somewhat comfortable with the instrument. Again, that could be different if you are a pianist or uh, coming from uh, another keyboard-like instrument, like synthesizers or something like that. Um, so I hope that answers some of your questions. So let's do this uh, Pachelbel's version of A Mighty Fortress.
By the way, let's do a little interactive activity. Uh, if you have more questions, I will try to answer them as best as I can. But meanwhile, I do have a suggestion for you. Since we've been doing hymns, um, as I start to play the next piece, I want you to think about what might be your favorite hymn that you grew up with or that you remember, or maybe it's not your favorite hymn, but it's the hymn that you always remember. Um, and if you think of it, would you mind just posting it uh, or commenting on whatever streaming service you are using? Um, because we have a little fun activity a little bit later on that you're going to help me with. So tell me what is your favorite hymn, OK? Um, the last piece in this first half is the third improvisation of the three liturgical improvisations by George Olroyd, who was uh, born in 1886 and died in 1951. He was an English organist, composer, and teacher of Anglican church music. He was organist at St. Albans Church, Holborn, from 1919 to 1920, and then spent the rest of his life at the St. Michael's Church in Croydon until the day of his death, 1956. In this improvisation, Mr. Olroyd takes the main hymn tune, Verbum Supernum Prodiens, and winds his way from a quiet reflection. Yeah, organ, organ can actually, the organ can actually play pretty quietly, believe it or not. And he develops it and until it becomes this very loud song of praise at the very end. And you could see why as I translate the Latin text for you. Pour light upon us from above, and fire our hearts with thy strong love. Praise to the Father and to the Son through all the ages as they run, and to the Holy Paraclete, or Spirit, be praise with them and worship meet. Amen.
All right, there's another question, and that is, if the organ can make a sound like the bagpipe? Well, that's a good question. While the organ is sort of like a synthesizer, it is not exactly 100% like a synthesizer, where a synthesizer could have a sample or a picture already of something that sounds like the bagpipe. Uh, the organ doesn't have that, although um, if you know the technique of a bagpipe, you could probably fake it a little bit. And so knowing that a bagpipe has some sort of drone, you know, you could get something that could somehow sound like that. Maybe I could use a more something like this. Uh, maybe try this one. Uh, no? Let's see. So if you kind of know how the instrument works, you might be able to somewhat fake it. Um, but it's not a really a bagpipe sound that I pull out and say bagpipe. The modern instruments, on the other hand, could have that. Well, this evening, I would like to share a little with you about the organ. And I'm, I'm so glad that you've had questions, and um, I'm happy to share those. Uh, but let me just share a little bit more about this instrument, because I think uh, some of you uh, maybe would be surprised to, to find out some of these facts from this instrument. Uh, for, the, for those of you who follow organs, who are into organ, who are organ nerds, if you will, uh, this is an Aeolian Skinner organ, sort of. And I say that because it's really made out of parts of a bunch of different organs. And that is thanks to the ingenuity of a uh, longtime uh, faculty and professor at La Sierra, Donald Vaughn, who together with his students um, built this instrument from spare parts, essentially. Um, and that means that they used old technology. Uh, in fact, they even used, for those of you who are old enough to know what a telephone relay system is with all the wires, it even used one of those, OK? So there are parts of this instrument that go all the way back to like 1933. And, uh, but the majority of the guts of the instrument, if you will, are from the 60s, 1960s and later. So um, if you took a a cursory look at any website online that talks about pipe organs like Wikipedia or anything like that, you might come up with something that says a musical instrument that produced sound by driving pressurized air called wind through the organ pipe selected from a keyboard because each pipe produces one pitch. That's it. The pipes are provided in sets that we call ranks. And by the way, organs are known by their ranks. and We'll talk about that in a little bit each which has a common timbre or color characteristic, and a volume. So every pipe um, that has a different timbre has a different volume characteristic. Some pipes are very, very soft. Um, something like this, perhaps. And then some pipes are very loud. So um, every pipe only plays one pitch and, again, has different sets of volume depending on the timbre. Most organs have many ranks of pipes of different pitch and volume. And the player can employ singly or in combination through the use of controls called stops. All of these things that I have here and here that you could see, these are all called the stops, OK? Um, a stop has a name. It's usually either in English, German, French, or Italian that describes the timbre, often referencing a real instrument like trumpet, viola, trombone. 
So as I look here, I see a lot of that. Um, every stop also has a number in a large lettering, and that refers to the longest pipe in that particular rank. So remember, every one of these things that I pull out, called stops, represents 60 different pipes, okay? One pipe for every key, 60 different pipes, and that number just tells me which is the largest pipe in that rank or in that set of pipes. So for example, I pull one out here and it says 16. That means that the largest pipe is 16 feet, or is it? Ah, we'll get to that. Some pipes um, have a number that when compared with the real pipe does not correspond. So I might pull off a 16, but when I go to see that pipe, it's only eight feet. And so was that a mistake or what's going on here? That's because some pipes are not open at the top. Most pipes, the air comes in through the bottom and goes up and out of the pipe. But some pipes are stopped, which means the air travels eight feet in this case, hits the stop and comes back down another eight feet, thus producing a 16 foot pipe albeit with a different character, different color characteristic. But this is really helpful because not every church building has a large space for a very large pipe. Um, so, of course, the sound quality is different than a normal pipe of that stated length. As I mentioned, sound is affected by the size or the length of the pipe, the shape of the pipe. So we have cylindrical shapes, we have conical shapes, um, and we have square pipes. Yes, we actually have square pipes. It also is affected by the material of the pipe. The pipe could be metal or it could be wood. And whether the pipe has metal reeds or not. So of course, the room housing the pipes can also affect the perceived sound. So in a way, this organ is the precursor to, like I've been saying all along, our modern day synthesizer including the ones we use for the praise band here at La Sierra University Church. Um, a pipe organ usually has more than one keyboard or manual, as they're called. Um, and they're played by both hands. And then it has a pedal board, which is similar to the keyboard, but for the feet to play. The keyboards, the pedal board, and the stops are housed in the organ's console. The organ's continuous supply of wind allows it to sustain notes for as long as the corresponding keys are pressed, unlike the piano or the harpsichord. So if I go like this, as long as I keep this key down, it's going to keep sounding. And then it stops. The, um, the smallest portable pipe organs may have only one or two dozen pipes and one manual. The largest may have over 33,000 pipes and seven manuals. Our church organ is a fairly large instrument, believe it or not. It comprises of four manuals, a pedal board, and it even has what they call a virtual manual or a virtual keyboard that is digital. So at any one point in time, I could make that digital keyboard bring sounds to this keyboard or manual, to this manual, or to this manual. Um, because our church organ is fairly large and it has many stops, in fact, it has so many stops that it has what they say is about 125, approximately 125 working ranks. And I mean working. Um, it actually has more than that. It has probably about 150 ranks of pipes, but only about 125 or so, 120, 125 are working. Um, and at 60 keys per rank, you multiply 60 by 125 and you get over 7,000 pipes that are connected in this organ alone. That's a lot of pipes to tune and calibrate, a lot of pipes. Um, this instrument has about another 25 ranks of pipes that I really would love to see them connected, but they haven't been connected because maybe the pipes are in poor state or perhaps financially it's just too cost prohibitive to connect them. Um, 
if we were to build this instrument from scratch today, you know how much it would cost? Probably between two to three million dollars. So that's how much money it would take to build this instrument nowadays. Why don't you take a short tour with me and visit the chambers that house the pipes for each division or each manual. And as we come into the upstairs pipe chambers, I'm going to give you a head start here. We will encounter the rooms in this order. Swell, so all of the pipes that work with the swell, all the pipes that work with the grate, and then the pipes for the choir and positive. So let's take a peek inside as I walk you through. So here we are coming in to the chambers upstairs behind me. And the first thing you see are these bellows. These are reservoirs for wind to try to keep the pressure high enough so that when I press the key, it will fill the pipe ranks with enough air to sound. Also, look at those shades. I will talk about those later. But there is a square pipe. There are the metal pipes. Um, and you will see pipes of all sizes, including tiny little pipes. You might be able to see some of them. Look at the conical shapes of some of the pipes. Uh, the metal is different in some of them, as you can see right there. There are some more wooden pipes. And notice those funny things on the top? Those are stops. That means those pipes are not open at the top. There are some more conical shaped pipes. A lot of those conical shaped pipes are what they call reed pipes. They have a reed inside. And that's what allows me to play the trumpet sounds, uh, the bombard and trombone, all of those brass-like instruments. So that was the swell division, or the swell manual. Next, this is a very big one. And this is um, the grate. And the grate doesn't seem to have a lot of pipes. Notice, by the way, all of the digital circuitry that is here. Um, together with all of the crazy wiring that uh, is laid over from very old times. These are like from the telephone switchboard. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of little tiny little wires that all are connected to something that make this instrument sound. And these are the, th the wires that often are falling apart and um, this is uh, something that we would love to see this instrument get completely new wiring, um, which would make it uh, a modern instrument with uh, much more reliable sounds and mechanical and electronic uh, connections. So look at all that wire. It's just spaghetti code of wire. Um, I can't even begin to think about the kind of headache that would be to try to connect all of those. So here it is. Here's the grate. So this is the chamber right in the middle. As uh, you look at the organ, it's the one right in the middle. And look at all of those square pipes, a lot of those square pipes. Um, and notice that uh, there are uh, tiny little pipes down there, as you can see. Um, these are uh, the grate is the division or the keyboard that is used the most like for him playing. And um, it is key. Look at, look at the tops that are stopped on the wood and then on the, on the metal pipes that were behind the wood ones. You could see the little hat, the little uh, triangle-like hat or cap that stops those pipes. So every one of those pipes is twice the length in sound of what it looks like there. See some of the larger pipes that are 8 feet and 16 feet tall. And some of the, those are the air reservoirs that are right under all of the pipes. Some more spaghetti code, just in case you didn't get enough. So does anybody have any questions on any of that? pretty crazy. Well, if you have a question, ask it, and I will do my best to try to answer that. Um, 
Since the pipes keep playing while the keys are held down, and since every rank has a different volume parameter, how do we control volume on this organ? We can open up the shutters to the swell and to the choir division. So here's the, the swell and the choir. And this creates the illusion that the sound is getting louder when the shutters are open versus when the, sh the chamber is completely closed. In reality, the pipes keep sounding exactly the same. It's just the room that gets open or closed. And I don't know if uh, the camera can be uh, placed on the shutters. And I will open and close them. And you will see the light um, on the, as you're looking at the organ, look at the left hand, upper left hand side. And you should see light coming through and some shutters. And then you should see them close and open and close and open. And if I were to play, you could hear that. Open. Close. Of course, you can also add more pipes, and that creates more sound. But in the late Romantic period, they invented something called the crescendo pedal. Crescendo. And it's, it's the fun pedal. Basically, what a crescendo pedal does for you is it automatically starts adding ranks of pipes for you. So I can hold something like this, and I could use a crescendo pedal and you could see how it begins to add more pipes. And of course, the more I crescendo, the more pipes get added, the more sound it makes. So that's another way of creating sound. So hope you enjoyed some of, the, uh, some of those facts from this particular organ. The next piece I would like to perform, I regret to say, has not been written yet. What do you mean? Well, in fact, I have no clue how it will sound. But I have faith that you will help me. OK, so earlier I had asked you to post or comment what is your favorite or best known hymn. If you haven't done so already, hurry up and send it in. But my guess is that uh, Pastor Devo has been collecting these. Um, and so. I'm hoping that I can take maybe up to three hymns. And I will try to, with the inspiration from the Spirit, which you should pray right now so that I, the Spirit will inspire me, um, that I will try to make an arrangement on the spot here that will feature the main tunes from um, these hymns while I try to explore the sounds of the organ. So let me see what Pastor Devo has for me. He also said David Johnson helped bring a lot. By the way, uh, Pastor Deaver reminds me, I wasn't here, so that our own David Johnson uh, helped in laying a lot of those wires that you saw, a lot of that spaghetti coat up there. So uh, thanks to, a shout out to David Johnson for his help in getting this instrument to actually sound. All right, so here are the hymns. The first one that came in was Wally in the garden. And then there's quite a few are asking for Great is Thy Faithfulness. Okay, Great is Thy Faithfulness has quite a few asking. I come to the garden. Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee has quite a few. And the doxology. All right, so let's and see. All right, that's a lot of hymns. <laughs> I can tell you that I won't be able to do all 20 hymns. Uh, but I will do my best to do at least three of these, maybe four. We'll see. And um, we'll see how it goes. So you can start praying any time now.
Wow, okay. Um, as I often would say, don't uh, ask me to repeat that again because I have no idea what I would do the next time. But thank you for praying and thank you for making those beautiful hymns, uh, choosing those beautiful hymns. And there were so many other wonderful hymns. Uh, maybe we can do this another time. Um, I, I really love the heritage of the church and so uh, anytime I get a chance to play these hymns, I'm always so thankful. So thank you again for helping me with this part. So we're almost at the end here. The next, uh, the next to the last piece on the program is a short fugue. And I decided I wanted to do this because it's a technique practiced by many composers since the late Renaissance period to, to modernity. The technique was to pick a melody, then play with the melody by bringing the melody in different voices or in different sounds, um, while the other voices would create counterpoint by bringing out other melodies. It sounds complicated, and it, it was, and it is. Um, in the Baroque period, the fugue was often used as a compositional device for exploring a hymn tune like our friend uh, Pachelbel did with A Mighty Fortress. Um, sometimes the melody was not connected to any well-known hymn tune, uh, but could still serve as a role in the service, like a prelude or a postlude. So this next piece is by the German-Danish composer Dietrich Buxtehude who lived in 1637 to 1707. His organ works represent a central part of the standard organ repertoire of the Middle Baroque period. And he was influential uh, to many uh, of his contemporary uh, compositions uh, and composers, I meant to say, and uh, performers, including Johann Sebastian Bach, who was his student for a short time. Uh, in fact, Bach walked over 50 kilometers uh, just to see and hear him and to have some lessons with him. Um, left his church job just to do that. Uh, the church was infuriated with, uh, with Bach for, for leaving them stranded, but he was determined to try to meet this uh, composer and to learn from him. So this is his Fugue in C major, which is a joyful composition full of dance-like qualities that would have encouraged and filled with joy the listeners of his time.
So this evening I've had the privilege to share with you about some composers and compositions that inspire me and give me hope and feed my faith in this time. I've also shared with you a bit about this wonderful instrument at the La Sierra University Church. For my last piece, I'll be playing a Virgil Fox setting of Bach's Now Thank We All Our God, which came from Bach's cantata number 79, one of his more than 200 cantatas, um, among other works using the same tune. The original hymn is attributed to the Protestant minister Martin Rinkart, with the melody attributed to Johann Kruger. This piece has a special significance to our current global pandemic. As a Lutheran minister who came to Eilenburg, Saxony at the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, Rinkart's home quickly became a refuge for the political and military victims of the war. However, because of overcrowding, deadly pestilence and famine arose. During the height of the severe plague in 1637, Rinkart was the only surviving pastor in Eilenburg, conducting as many as 50 funerals in a day. He performed more than 4,000 funerals in that year alone, including that of his wife's. As a prolific hymn writer, it's not surprising that during this difficult time, Rinkart would write many hymns, including the well-known Nun Danket Alle Gott, or Now Thank We All Our God. Listen to, listen to the words of verse 2. O may this bounteous God, through all of our life, be near us, with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us, and keep us in his grace, and guide us, the perplexed, and free us from all ills in this world and the next. May this be our song of praise and thanksgiving for the risen Christ, who also promises that he will never fail us or leave us and will free us from all ills.
us, may it give us hope.